I'm Terry Ponchek, Chairman of the Colloquium Committee, and welcome to the fifth of our seven uh, colloquium series. Uh, before I start, I have two announcements and a reminder to turn off your cell phones. Uh, the first announcement is about our sixth colloquium, which will be held on Thursday, March 17th. Erwin Chermerinsky, renowned constitutional law scholar and dean of the UC Irvine Law School, will be here to talk to us about the impact that the Supreme Court could have on the 2016 election. <laughs> an odd event, uh, the impact that the election could have on the Supreme Court. So this is obviously an extremely timely topic and it will be very, very interesting to hear what the Dean has to say uh, about both of these and we hope you'll join us. That will be on Thursday, March 17th. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Olga Olicker. She's an author, she's a political commentator, and she is a senior advisor and director of the Russian and Eurasian program at the Center of Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Prior to that, she was the director of RAND Center for Russia and Eurasia. She's an expert on countries in tra transition, particularly on Russia, Ukraine, and the Central Asian and Cauc Caucasus succession states to the Soviet Union. She's here today to help us make sense of and to answer our questions about Russia's foreign policy. Please welcome Olga Olicker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I um, want to first of all uh, say how glad I am to be here today. It's um, always nice to be in California generally and in Los Angeles specifically. So I would like to thank the Plato Society for inviting me out to escape the confusing East Coast vacillation between winter and spring and uh, come to Los Angeles where the weather is a little less confusing. Um, and um, also thank the Skirball Center for hosting this event. Um, so what I said I would talk about today is Vladimir Putin and Russian foreign policy. Russian foreign policy is a very big topic. Uh, I cannot promise that I will cover all of it. What I'm going to do instead is provide a broad overview of how I see Russia's view of the world, my view of Russia's view, um, the extent to which Russian foreign policy is a product of its president, that is to say Putin, as opposed to reflecting things and interests that would be much the same regardless of who is in charge, and then delve into a few examples of how this manifests in a few key parts of the world. Um, then I expect to have a good bit of time for Q&A when you can ask me the things you're actually curious about and I can do my best to answer them. So what exactly is going on with Russian foreign policy? Uh, what does Russia want? Um, the way I usually talk about this is by arguing that Russia has some very clear strategic goals. There are things Russia wants to accomplish in a very, very broad sense, but it tends to pursue them opportunistically. What do I mean? Well, to explain that, I think I need to start with how I see Russia's goals. And the simplest way I have of putting it is that Russia wants respect. Uh, but it's a very specific sort of respect that Russia wants. Russia wants to be clearly and unquestionably recognized as a great power, uh, to ensure that its interests are taken into account when other countries make decisions and take actions which might or might not actually affect Russia. Um, and those interests are sometimes a bit more clear, a bit less clear clear, but what it comes down to is whether or not Russia actually knows what it wants, whether in any specific region or in any specific issue it has fully defined and articulated its position, it wants a seat at the table. It wants to be one of the ones making, uh, making the decisions. And Russian analysts, Russian officials, and Russian government documents tend to harp on things like this quite a bit. Um, so for instance, Russia's new national security strategy, which came out at the very end of last year, on December 31st, it very early on expresses pride in Russia's increased role in, quote, solving the most important international problems. It lists ensuring Russia's status as one of the world's great powers as one of the country's fundamental long-term interests. 
In the section on economics, it states that Russia aims to raise its GDP to one of the largest in the world. You know, this, this is an odd sort of economic aim. You know, you, you, you'd want to see why that's connected to anything, but it's not, it's just sitting there. You know, one of the things we're gonna do, our GDP is gonna be one of the biggest in the world. And the final words of that document of Russia's national security strategy are, increase the competitiveness and international prestige of the Russian Federation. So what that tells me is that Russia's not so happy with its current level of prestige, it thinks it's insufficient, and it's focused on increasing it. Okay, how does one increase one's prestige and one's respect when one is a really big country spanning two continents, 11 time zones, so on and so forth? Well, there are a few components of it. Uh, one of them is the seat at the table piece. Another, um, and relatedly, is um, this idea of having allies and influence. Great powers have allies, great powers have influence. Russia views itself as having almost a natural right to influence among the states on its periphery. It sees kind of this, this these as God-given interests, right? These countries that um, used to be part of the Soviet Union. Before that, they were part of the Russian Empire. Um, I've got a little pointer here, if I can make it work, right? So, yeah, sort of this, this these countries, right? Um, and beyond that, it gets a little muddier and a little fuzzier of it wants more influence, it wants more relationships, but it's less clear how it goes about that. There's less of a sense of ownership. Um, so let's take a step back now and ask whether this fairly big piece of what it, what it is that's driving Russia is an artifact of Vladimir Putin or an artifact of Russia. I'd argue very strongly that it's Russia, it's not Putin. Russian writing and discussion, both of issues of prestige and its attitude towards its neighborhood, have been strikingly consistent since the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Kremlin has been talking about its right to defend Russian speakers abroad since the 1990s. It has been trying to use economic leverage, political pressure, and the occasional use of forces to exert influence over these countries, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, countries of Central Asia and the South Caucasus, since that time as well. So this isn't new. Russia also has, since that time, been unhappy about the political order in Europe, the one that emerged at the end of the Cold War. Uh, the general attitude of post-Cold War Russia towards NATO enlargement has always struck me as kind of that of a child who dropped a bag of candy and has seen another child pick up that bag of candy and start eating it instead of giving it back. The notion that the countries that have joined NATO over the last quarter century might have done that because they saw membership, not because the alliance was expanding, you know, kind of it eating them up, uh, is somewhat foreign to the Russian narrative. That's just not how they describe it. it. The idea that the Poles or the Czechs wanted to be in NATO just doesn't occur to them. Rather, they see these little countries which you know the polls might argue as to whether or not they're a little country, but they see these countries as spoils that larger powers fight over or share. They're not actors in their own right. They don't have agency. So if something happens to them, if they do it, it's not that they've done it, it's that some other great power has done it to them. Um, and if Russia has a right to them, if Russia has a right to influence, well then they were taking advantage of Russian weakness at the time to expand. So while this attitude is old, there are a few things that are new that have manifested themselves very clearly over the last couple of years. And that's Russia doing very much about it, other than talking. Russia's annexation of Crimea and its military action in East Ukraine, I don't think it, these things were intended to upend the European security order established after the end of the Cold War. Russia's goals in Ukraine, they're actually what they've always been. Uh, just basically to keep Ukraine firmly in Moscow's orbit. They don't want to own that territory, they want to influence that territory. They don't want land, they want allies or vassals or however you want to think about it. This is now supplemented by a very strong intention to ensure that the government that was put in place by the Maidan, which in um, Russia's narrative was an extra constitutional, western-backed um, process that undermined a, a democratically elected government. So Russia's goal is to ensure that that does not work, that that fails, that nothing that this government that was put in place in this way, um, nothing that that government does can succeed. Um, but then what happened was, the
the Western response, which surprised Moscow. Uh, Moscow really did not anticipate quite a strong response from NATO, the EU, the United States. And this, on the one hand, has hurt Russia, uh, the sanctions and so forth, but on the other, it's also presented an opportunity. And as I said, Russia's goals are strategic, but it pursues them opportunistically. So what do I mean? So Russia's proprietary attitude towards Ukraine wasn't news to anybody. Um, so, you know, the idea that uh, Russia might take military action in Ukraine, it's not that it was a shock, it's not that anybody thought it was impossible, it's more that everybody thought that there would be ways to avoid it. The, over the last 20 odd years we were integrating the Russians, they wouldn't actually do that. But it wasn't that it was impossible. Um, but what it turned out was that military action by one European power against another was something that a lot of people in Europe and the United States had thought was relegated to the dustbin of history at the end of the bloody Balkans wars of the 1990s, right? It's not that countries don't invade other countries in the 21st century because the United States has proven that's not true. It's that European countries aren't supposed to invade other European countries. So the real concern underlying European and US responses to Russian action was that if Russia was going to do this in Ukraine, would it also do this elsewhere? Are other countries at risk? Is Russia going to use military force to attain goals in Europe, thereby undermining the stability that had been built at a lot of effort and um you know, a certain amount of pain in Europe. Um, you know, is there a possibility that Russia is going to bring everything back to the nastiness of the first half of the 20th century? And most importantly, is it going to threaten NATO members, such as the three Baltic countries, which, well, they also used to be Soviet countries, you know, Russian Empire, all of that is, even though Russia never said anything, the, the Russian government did not express uh, any ownership intent towards the Baltics, but you know, they never expressed that towards Ukraine either, and they certainly have sought more influence over the Baltics, and they certainly were very unhappy when the Baltic countries joined NATO. So I would argue that it was this concern that led this desire to demonstrate very clearly to Russia that anything like that, any action of this sort, would be unacceptable. And that was what drove responses then, and that's what drives responses now, right? If you look at the defense package of assurance um, that is, you know, the, the Secretary of Defense recently announced, you look at how that's being implemented, that's not about Ukraine. That's about the Baltics and Poland. So what the European response did for the Russians, though, is it cemented for them this view that the West was antagonistic towards them. All that Russia was doing was exerting its natural right to influence in Ukraine. But this presented an opportunity, which was to put forward the narrative at home and abroad, well, a narrative which I think at least some genuinely believe of a brave Russia standing up to a bullying United States and its NATO lackeys while it's trying to um, protect the besieged people of East Ukraine. Um, so meanwhile, this often voiced concern within NATO and the EU about their ability to maintain a unified voice, to maintain solidarity, uh, made it very clear to Russia that the Europeans were nervous about their solidarity, so maybe there's some room to weaken the coalition. So while Russia is unhappy about the sanctions, while Russia is surprised at the Western response, Russia also might be looking at this as an opportunity to um, maybe not undermine the European order in the very, very near term, but to look to see if there are chinks in that armor that might be exploited, uh, and look over time for openings to reverse or change the the situation and to increase its own influence. So whether that's through media, whether that's through supporting political parties, none of this stuff is working terribly well, but the fact that Russia is trying to do it indicates that it thinks there's a softness there that could be exploited. So that's Europe. Um, and I'm happy to return to it more in the Q&A. But I'd like to turn at least briefly to Syria because Syria is another place where Russia is exploiting an opportunity to give itself a place at the table, a place that it actually had at the table. I mean, as in Europe, nobody was, everybody saw Russia as having a voice, if not a vote, but you know, and, and Russia as a ally of Assad was seen as an important player in Syria. But by going in militarily, Russia has basically bombed its way to a very central role. 
Now, Russia's goals in Syria have been pretty consistent from the very start. Um, Russia viewed the popular uprisings in the Middle East much the same way that it viewed the Maidan in Ukraine, as dangerous, unstable, and quite possibly Western-backed. Um, U.S. support for the anti-Assad coalition opposition in, um, in Syria first supports that argument that the U.S. is trying to overthrow governments uh, wherever they may be. Um, but it's also, you know, it's, it's a matter, it views this as creating chaos where there should be order, that what you want to do when you've got a popular uprising that turns very, very violent is you help the government in power suppress it. Um, so, and, and in, in the case of the Assad government, in the case of Syria, Russia has had a strong and long-term relationship with that government. Um, so Russia's decision to prop up Assad was not was not a shock. I think what everybody was shocked at, perhaps, was how effective it's been, that it has uh, kept the Assad government from falling, um, that it has actually helped it gain some territory. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure anyone was that confident that this would happen. But it also meant, as I said, that Russia had bombed its way to a very important seat at the table for any settlement, and that's important both for supporting Assad and generally I think saying that supporting Assad is shorthand. Um, it's really about maintaining the existing system rather than Assad himself and maintaining Russian influence over whoever comes into power at Syria. But it's also about demonstrating that Russia is a great power, that Russia has a voice on the most important issues in the world today. Um, before turning away from Syria, it is also very worth pointing out there are a large number, uh, estimates vary high hundreds to the low to mid thousands of Russians, uh, Russian citizens fighting with and in some case leading, cases leading uh, Daesh factions uh, and linked factions in Syria. These are uh, mainly Muslims from Russia's very poor North Caucasus region. Yeah, it's right around here. Um, you may remember this region from the wars in Chechnya in the 1990s and some very high profile terror attacks since then. You may think uh, shorthand for that is Chechnya. Chechnya is one of several uh, little internal republics uh, within Russia that fit, you know, they're very, very poor. They're predominantly Muslim. Uh, they've gotten limited government att uh, attention and funding over the years. Uh, they, look, they look a bit different from the rest of Russia. They they have higher, um, uh, higher rates of childbirth um, and so forth. So one argument that Vladimir Putin, among others, have made publicly is that Russia is fighting in Syria to ensure that these people are killed there and they don't come back to Russia. Um, <laughs> Now, this is kind of a weak argument uh, <laughs> because, well, for one thing, they're going back and forth now, right? They're going back, they're going, you, you've got to have something that's building them, and a lot of people argue that what's building them is a continued Russian crackdown on Islam, on um, the ability of people to worship freely in the region, people feeling that they're under siege, Muslims all over Russia feeling persecuted, that that's driving some of this radicalism and perhaps their desire to go to Syria and learn how to fight so they can come home and continue the revolution there. And, you know, these are some of the leaders are people who were leading the revolution in the North Caucasus and have now gone to Syria because it's all one big global revolution to them. They also leave brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, children, so forth behind them who probably share their beliefs, who will probably raise more children in these beliefs, who will see the martyrdom of somebody who went to Syria to fight as that, not as a cautionary tale. So the odds that it's going to work, the killing them over there is going to work are pretty low. Um, but this said, I think it does underline the fact that Russia is genuinely concerned about radical Islamist terror globally, that it does see this as an international threat, and that is one factor in its intervention in Syria. So on, on the one hand, kind of this argument that they're doing it to kill them all over there, we have to fight them over there so we don't have to fight, so we don't have to fight them at home, is uh, flawed. But on the other hand, it does come from uh, a position of concern that the United States and European countries very probably share. So we've talked a bit about Europe and the Middle East. What about Asia? I mean, again, um, a lot of Russia, most of Russia, two-thirds, is in Asia. Yet 
Russian policies, Russian power has historically been focused much more on Europe than on, than on Asia. And like the United States, Russia has recently announced a pivot uh, to Asia. Um, this isn't the first time Russia has announced uh, a shift of focus to, uh, to Asia. It's been part of the rhetoric off and on since 1996. It sort of comes up periodically. Uh, and historically what's happened with these pivots is that Russia doesn't identify any clear goals in the region. Um, it has a, a strong relationship with China, and as a result of that, it tends to follow China's lead. And its relationship with China isn't really about Asia. Its relationship with China is global. It's about having another great power partner. Um, and this is still true. Uh, Russia has been making more of a point of its interest in Asia over the last two years because of European sanctions, and it's making this argument that that's fine, you, you, we'll, we'll just turn east. But actually turning east is difficult because there aren't the markets, there aren't the relationships. So you know, they, they got this gas deal with the Chinese, but there's no reason to think it's a particularly good gas deal for the Russians. It's a very good gas deal for the Chinese. Um, and there are continuing problems in Russia's relationship with China. That on the one hand, they agree on things. On the other hand, they both make the other nervous uh, the, for the very same reasons they both make everybody else nervous, right? Um, everybody's always concerned about other, other people's territorial ambitions and aggrandizement, and nobody's ever concerned about their own. There's also the challenge of what Russia wants from China is an ally. It wants to kind of build a new center of power, and China wants what it can get. I mean, in this one, China's the one that's very opportunistic and sees an opportunity in Russian weakness and Russian need. Russia has also been pursuing ties with other Asian countries. Um, Varying degrees of success, it's all fairly low scale. Um, there's room for this to evolve. I'd say the one big game changer in Asia would be normalization of relations with Japan, uh, which would really, um, that, that could make for revolutionary change, right? Because that would have an impact on Japan, Japan's relationship with the United States. It would make the Chinese even more nervous about the Russians, make the Chinese even more nervous about the Japanese. But Absent that, and I think that is going to be difficult to attain, in, part, in large part because of the Russians, uh, change will probably be evolutionary rather than revolutionary in Asia. So we're going to continue to see a Russia that wants to have seats at the table in, in Asia. And you know, it's actually been very useful occasionally on North Korea issues. So Russia's going to want to stay there, it's going to want to be a player, but it's not going to have very clear goals of its own that that make it particularly important, unless something blows up and Russia decides to bomb its way to the table there as well. So coming back to the question of what about this is Russia and what about this is Putin. I, what I hope I've kind of done is outline positions that, and by putting them in historical context, positions that have been Russia's positions for a very long time. So we make a mistake in ascribing Russia's overall approaches and interests to its president. Um, but the president does make a difference in how Russia pursues its interests. Another president probably would not have annexed Crimea and sent military forces into East Ukraine. So what makes that difference? Decision making in Russia, most people would argue, has become very centralized. Vladimir Putin does consult with um, experts, circles of experts on issues. And they're probably different circles of experts on different issues. But they don't have power, right? They're people he consults with. There's a parliament, but the parliament is largely a rubber stamp parliament controlled by the United Russia Party, which is Putin's party. Oppositionists may voice their views, they may publish, but they don't change policy. Uh, the ministers that Putin appoints answer to Putin. They like these, advi these advisors. They're increasingly nervous about saying the wrong thing. Um, Putin has a reputation for cutting people off if he gets upset with them. So they're going to be very careful about the information that they give him. Um, 
And there's not a lot of public debate that actually enters into Russian foreign policy decision making. There's lots of public debate in the general sense, right? There's still opposition press. There are people voicing all sorts of viewpoints and opinions in, in Russia. But that's not, um, that's not a debate within government. Now when you have a government which has debate, whether that's behind closed doors or in the public eye, it probably has a bit of a tendency towards more conservative approaches because different viewpoints will cancel each other out, people will raise objections. When you have one person making all of the decisions, uh, then you end up having less predictability. And particularly if that person has a tendency to be, let's say, a bit whimsical, uh, a bit emotional, uh, kind of respond to things. It's not that he's crazy, he's by no means crazy, but you know, he's presented with a situation, he decides something needs to be done, nobody says, well, Mr. President, maybe that's not the thing we ought to be doing. People say, okay, that's what he said we're gonna do, let's go do that. So I would argue that the real danger um, of what we're seeing here in Russia is this isolated, centralized decision making um, by somebody who's shown this proclivity towards whimsy and emotion, and who, because of the fear people have of bringing information to him that he might disagree with, may not be getting the most complete picture, the most complete analysis of the situation um, around him. So the bottom line for me is it's Russia, it's not Putin that's driving both the strategic goals and some of the search for opportunistic ways to pursue them. It's Putin that's making it hard to predict exactly how this is going to play out. Um, I'm going to stop there and ask for questions and uh, hope we can have a good discussion. This, I think, really does scratch the surface, but hopefully in an interesting way. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hey there. Good presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, could you go over a little bit between about the uh, uh, military skirmishes between China and Russia? I've heard there's been major ones, but I I didn't know that. I don't know the details. Skirmishes between them? Yes. Uh, not uh, not in a few decades. Oh really? <laughs> you sure. Okay. Yeah, no, they're not. They're not fighting. They they exercise together, but that's on the same side. That answered my question. Thanks. And uh, they they uh, some Russian exercises postulate adversaries that look like China, but they yeah. Thank you for your talk. I you said, uh, and I always assumed that Russia was worried about Islamic terrorism, but their focus appears to be on America and American interests and not on Daesh at all, right? Am I correct on that? And if so, why? So there's, it's, it's very interesting. The military forces Russia builds and has built don't look like the ones you want for the wars that Russia fights. The wars that Russia fights are generally on its periphery. And the military forces it builds and looks to be focused on are the ones you build to fight the United States and NATO. And none of this actually addresses the, the Islamic terrorist threat. Well, there's a the domestic one and there's the international one. For the domestic one, they, I think, for a long time felt that they'd gotten it under control in Chechnya by put, putting Ramzan Kadyrov in place and that stabilized Chechnya. But then you got this upsurge of terrorist activity in the rest of the North Caucasus and it affected Russia. But this isn't military, right? This is domestic, this is policing. If you look at how Russian budgets, security budgets have grown for a very long time, until really quite recently, the funding for internal security forces has been slightly above that for the military. So when you look at the dangers of Islamist terrorism at home, the Russians have really sought to fight that with the Interior Ministry Police, local police, and the FSB. When you look at it abroad, you know, I don't think they have any more of a clue on what to do about it than we do. So, yeah, so they're gonna fight in Syria, they think stability, right? What you want is stability, so that, that's kind of the response in Syria. But I don't think they have a real sense of what you do with your armed forces to fight Islamist terrorism or Islamist movements, Islamist radicalism. I mean, you're not really fighting Islamist terrorism. Terrorism is a tactic these groups use, but you're, you're, not, you're not fighting jihadist groups, um, radical jihadist groups abroad. I don't think they know how to do that, and I, but I'm not sure anybody really does. 
Uh, are you familiar with RT, Russia Today, and do you think it's very effective, and does the United States have something equivalent? Um, I don't think RT is terribly effective. I don't think it changes a lot of minds that um, aren't, you know, uh, inclined to think uh, that way in the first place. I do think the Russians have poured a ton of money into it, which sort of lets me gives me that thought of, you know, if your adversary is making a mistake, let them keep making it. I think right now, kind of the idea of information warfare is a challenging one. I think what the Russians are very good at, and RT is part of this, but not all of this, is raising questions about a dominant narrative. So if you put forward something that appears to be true, a uh, separatist uh, missile shot down that airplane over Ukraine, they'll raise a lot of questions about it. Well, what if it was a Ukrainian missile? What if it was an American airplane that hit it? What if something else happened? And you get all those stories in there and it muddies the picture. Um, that isn't actually pushing forward a Russian viewpoint. What it does is it's raising questions about other viewpoints. I think the information space today is such that that is something you can do. It's not one where it's easy to clearly provide an alternative, right? During the Soviet Union, everybody knew that Soviet news and TV lied. I mean, even Soviets who believed in the Soviet Union, they knew that their grain harvest hadn't actually been that good, right? So they knew that this wasn't true. And so they'd listen to Voice of America or Radio Liberty and think, well, maybe some of that is true or maybe it tracks better with what I know. Right now, everyone can get the information they want that tracks with their own viewpoints. So this idea that if you just tell the truth enough, people will hear it, well, yeah, some people will. But you won't necessarily convince those who are determined not to. So I don't think it's a matter of responding to RT specifically. RT is part of a package that is much better at sowing doubt than it is at sowing support for Russia. And how you counter that is a much more complex question. And one that, I mean, look, in the United States, we have an election campaign where people keep telling lies. It's not as though the Russians have a monopoly on saying things that are patently untrue and having a whole lot of people uh, you know, repost them on social media and ensure that all their friends believe them. So, I mean, I think this is kind of a deeper question about the discourse in the age of information than it is uh, specifically about Russia and the United States. In, in the uh, Russian, in the Iran deal, it seems to me that Russia played what looked like a fairly constructive role, but I don't see that role being played in Syria or Crimea or any of the other places. Do we have enough common interest with Russia to trust them in other areas? So I would argue we trust the Russians when we actually have common interests, and we don't when we don't. We don't trust them too much even when we do. Look, they had a common interest with us in Iran, North Korea also, right? We actually have the same goals, and we have different ways of pursuing them. In Syria, everybody has different goals. I mean, I keep thinking of Syria as Tolkien's Battle of Five Armies, which everyone says was about World War I. But you know, even the allies don't actually like each other. We and the Turks don't agree. Um, the oppositionists that we, the United States, is backing in Syria have a different goal. They, they want to overthrow Assad. We want to go after Daesh. The Russians want to support Assad. Everybody's doing different things. So I'm not sure, what does constructive mean? Does constructive mean be on our side? Um, in that case, no, but you know, in that case, we have problems with everybody, uh, including the people we're supporting in Syria. Um, in Crimea, they're absolutely at odds with us. Uh, they annexed Crimea, and we think that was a terrible idea, and so does most of the world. There are very few countries that don't look at that and aren't a bit alarmed that they went in and grabbed a chunk of territory from somebody else. Um, so yes, that's that's generally considered not constructive by most, uh, most standards. Um, so, but you know, kind of this question of whether they can play a constructive role, I think it's asking the wrong question. You have to go at it. you have to come at it from the perspective of what are they trying to accomplish? What are they trying to do? Do we agree? Do we disagree? If we agree, are there ways to pursue it in collaboration? If we disagree, how do we keep it from escalating? Are there points of negotiation? Are there ways out of the mess before it becomes a worse mess? And if we think they're going to do something that's really, really awful or might, how do we keep them from doing it? Right? That that's I think that that's the attitude that one has to have really towards most countries, just that Russia has shown a proclivity for doing some things that we're really unhappy with lately. Uh, yesterday I heard Wesley Clark in a panel discuss the similarities of uh, Putin and Erdogan. Er 
Erdogan, uh, and the problems between uh, Russia and Turkey and how it could uh, lead to a situation that destroyed NATO, that uh, led to the use of tac tactical nuclear weapon, et cetera. I'd like your comment on that. Okay, that, that's a lot, right? We've got destroying NATO, we've got tactical nuclear weapons, and all of this from Putin and Erdogan. Um, Putin and Erdogan ha certainly have a few things in common. Um, they also have uh, some real differences, particularly. Well, they, they, but they do, you know, they do have a certain tendency towards centralized leadership, towards not listening to other people, towards their desire to use religion domestically as political tools, all of that, and they are also both seem to be fairly impetuous. Um, so that. Um, I think the question with NATO is more whether U.S. disagreements with Turkey in Syria threaten the alliance. I don't think they do at this point. They certainly continue to make Syria more of a mess. But I think the alliance is pretty solid on that for now. I think the real, the real issues for the alliance are what are the security threats to the NATO countries, what are the best ways of meeting them, and who pays for them. And those are kind of the issues of the alliance that have always been at the forefront. It's just that right now you actually do have security concerns coming both from the south and potentially from Russia, and that is forcing a much uh, more immediate debate. Uh, use of tactical nuclear weapons. Um, so Russia has a very clear uh, published policy on nuclear weapons use, which is that nuclear weapons will only be used in the event of an existential threat to the state. That's actually a higher bar than the United States officially puts on nuclear weapons use. Um, the Soviet Union had a no first use policy, the United States never did, and Russia got rid of it fairly early um, into its independence. So in theory, you know, based on that, Russian policy is that Russia would only use nuclear weapons in a conflict if it thought the country was at risk. At the same time, you have Russian officials saying things about, hey, don't forget about our that we're a nuclear power. You've got uh, Russian television commentators talking about their ability to um, turn the United States to ash. Now, I mean, I'm sure, sure there are American radio and television commentators and folks running podcasts who say similar things, but this is somebody who is viewed as having pretty good ties to the government, they definitely are happy with the brandishing of this and the issuing of threats. And back in the 90s, there was a consideration of changing Russian policy. It actually looked like it had changed a little bit. Um, for a while, they did allow for first use of nuclear weapons with a lower threshold, you know, kind of an as necessary. And at the time, it did seem that the policy they had was that you might want to do a small nuclear strike just to show everybody you're serious, which actually, if you've read a lot of nuclear deterrence theory is not, it's an idea that's been around for a long time and plenty of Americans have had it in their heads too. Um, they seem to have walked back from that um, in the late 90s. There's some evidence, both from these government statements and from a few exercises here and there, that there might be some people who think that's wise in Russia again. But the Russians really, you know, I, I don't think that, I think, their view on nuclear weapons is not that different from the view in the United States, which is to say that there are some people who have worked with nuclear weapons for a long time in the military who think it'd be really awesome to figure out how to use them and how to make smaller ones and how to make them more usable. And then, there are the rest of, then there's the rest of the government who thinks that would be completely insane and will generally keep it from happening. So I, I do think, I, I also would throw out that the reason for Russia to go to tactical nuclear weapons use, even in the event, or, or strategic nuclear weapons use, even in the event of an existential threat is this fear that their conventional weapons aren't good enough. Um, and they've been building up their conventional capability and they've been trying to demonstrate it. And you know, th this, this is kind of, this is the catch-22. It's that they don't want to go to nuclear weapons. They, want, they actually want to build up their conventional capacity. Their military doctrine talks about improving their conventional deterrence. I think all of that speaks to nuclear weapons still very much being a weapon of last resort. But you do have this tendency to threaten and brandish, which is in and of itself destabilizing. Okay. I have two related questions uh, based on what you said. One was that Russia wants to have influence uh, over the states that are on its border, and the other is that it wants a seat at the table. Why would we be concerned about Russia having either of those? 
So I think, um, as I said, I think in terms of Europe, the fear is that this touches on countries that we are allied with, that we have alliance commitments with, that we have long-term relationships with, but especially that we in the United States have alliance commitments to. We have Article 5 commitments to the Baltic countries that we will consider a threat to, and, and Poland, that we will consider a threat to them as a threat to ourselves. So that has a very strong potential that if Russia really does have designs on those countries to drag us into a war. We don't want that. We'd rather they not have design. I mean, this, this is why you make alliances. Um, Ukraine, Central Asia, you know, this, this is sort of an area where the United States has to make some choices, but you'll notice in Georgia and in Ukraine, we don't do a lot. We demarch strongly, we, you know, we impose sanctions, but we're not planning to go to war. This is more about sort of um, upholding what we see as global norms in a global context than it is about you know fighting or fighting for influence. Uh, to some extent, I think there are people in the US government who if you could convince them this was just about Ukraine, they'd say fine. Particularly after two years of trying to work with Ukraine, which is a notoriously difficult country to work with. But the concern is that Russia's goals are bigger than that. Um, as for a seat at the table, you know, it depends, right? Too many people with too many seats at the table, we have certain interests. If their interests are different from ours, maybe we don't want them to have a seat at the table, right? This is, maybe we'd rather that we could, and if they haven't figured out what their interests are and they just want a seat at the table and perhaps one of their interests is just countering us and just making it harder for us, which they've shown also a tendency towards, then why invite them to play a spoiler role. But I think overall the U.S. government is open to Russia having seats at various tables. Um, it's not open to potentially um, aggressive Russia that's looking to weaken other states and that's looking to weaken our own influence globally. Hi. Um, you know, Russia is a pretty big country. Yeah. And uh, to provide some context for us, what's the history of how it got put together in such a big way with all these other little countries around it. And if you draw a line down you know, in the middle, you have probably half of the world's population there. We include India and China. I mean, it's an amazing... Population. Russia's population is about the size of the United States. No, I'm saying, but stick India and China and, you know, just that part of the world. There's a lot of people uh, there. In Asia, y yeah. Um, how, how did Russia w wind up with such a large geographic area? Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to I'm not gonna give you a history lesson going back to Kiev and Rus. No, no, it doesn't um, have to go too far back. I mean, I mean, just as the, I mean the, the kind of, of the big expanse of Russia has been Russian for a very long time. Uh, Russia now is probably the smallest it's been in a while because both the Russian Empire got a whole lot of these territories and it went back and forth, right? Poland in, Poland out, Baltic states. Um, Central Asia was uh, in the Caucasus partially con were conquered during Russian Empire. At the time of the revolution, one of the things that were promised to these uh, places was they'd have more independence under the Soviet Union than they had under the Tsars, so they would. Um, they, they, they would, uh, so the idea was that they would support the revolution. Uh, before that, during empire, um, there, was, there was some expansionism. I mean, Russia, but Russia was also invaded a lot, right? The Mongol hordes came through. Um, but you know, it's not, um, it's, it's similar to a lot of European history. Borders go in, borders go out. Uh, I'm sorry? It's real. It's really big, but it's not very populated. Um, it, you know, most people live in Europe. Most of the people living in Russia live in European Russia. In Asian Russia, it's kind of um, spot, it's spot settlements. Uh, there are a lot of indigenous peoples still living there who, you know, um, still li live to some extent by old ways and mechanisms. But it's kind of it's cities and uh, kind of this big vast center is largely depopulated. I mean, Canada is big too. Um, hi, Lou Perkins. Uh, as somebody who don't believe, uh, who doesn't believe that uh, anybody's riding a white horse, including our own aggressive behavior, uh, and that China does have a valid uh, reason for wanting the Straits of Malaga to get their their oil from from the. Uh, 
the Near East. Um, I'm more interested in things like how we can cooperatively work together because as the world does get smaller and the, the need for cooperative behavior and Boutrous Ghali is coming to New York and there's a trillion dollars that's appropri expropriated from, from Africa every year and these poor people are, uh, I, I'm more interested in the cooperative and constructive work that you see going on uh, as we get to 2050, you know, if we get there. Uh, if we get there uh, with the Russians. So, I mean, here there's a couple, there are problems on both sides of this equation to get to cooperation. Uh, on the U.S. side, I think kind of the uh, Crimea, Ukraine has really poisoned the well a lot. On the Russian side, they keep trying to poison that well. Uh, so for Russia, part of the prestige comes from, on the one hand, standing up to the United States, on the other hand, standing by the United States. They get a lot out of this narrative that they are standing up to us. And they have spent a lot of time at home fomenting hostility towards the US, which isn't to say that the US is a perfect and wonderful country in every imaginable way. It does happen to be the country I'm a citizen of, so, you know, it's, um, it's mine. Uh, so, you know, I would like to sh make its policy better, but also if somebody is threatening it, if somebody's countering it, I do tend to look to U.S. interests. Um, I think that the Russians are eager for some kinds of cooperation, particularly if it makes them look good. If it makes them look like they're working with the United States kind of on, a, on par, this kind of nostalgia for the Soviet Union, a lot of it is about being one of the most important countries in the world rather than just an important country. But the broad distrust of the United States, uh, some of it warranted, some of it not, the broad sense that the United States is out to get Russia makes cooperation difficult. And on our side, kind of this narrative of Russian aggressiveness makes it difficult. Uh, this said, I do think that where you find areas where cooperation is possible, where you can identify uh, common goals, nothing really precludes that. It's just hard. So, I, I mean, in terms of specifics, look, we could back off from our position on Syria and say, sure, we're going to um, chuck this opposition, these opposition folks we've been supporting because they're never going to pull a government together. We'll join with you in supporting this government that exists and bombing Daesh if you'll stop bombing hospitals and populated areas. And, you know, you could maybe get a deal there, but that would involve a significant step back from the United States and we're all sell selling out some partners, which I don't think the current administration is willing to do. Similarly, Russia could say, wow, we all agree that Ukraine is a mess and we maybe should get around to fixing it rather than continuing to make it worse. We're going to pull our troops out. We're going to stop supporting the separatists um, and let, let's find some way to make this work because at this point you guys are so sick of the Ukrainians that you, we understand you probably weren't going to let them into the EU or NATO anyway. We've got it so let's figure something out. But again, they don't, they don't trust enough that that's going to work out to do it. So. Picking up on your comments on Ukraine, we just recently saw a documentary done on the civil uprising in the Ukraine several years back. And at its conclusion, it was somewhat confusing as exactly what happened to the Ukraine, other than the president left and went to Russia and they were going to have new elections. What exactly is the nature of the, quote, government in the Ukraine at present? Uh, Ukraine has a democratically elected president, Petro Poroshenko, who was elected the summer of 2014 after the Maidan uprisings. Uh, there was no vote held in the separatist areas because nobody could get in to actually hold a, a vote. So he was elected by the, it was one of the reasons that he was so handily elected was that a lot of his uh, people who would have voted against him weren't part of the election, but there was no real alternative to that. Um, there's also a prime minister. Uh, you Ukraine has a split system, sort of like France, where the power is shared between the president and the prime minister, uh, which makes it very difficult sometimes to get things done in Ukraine uh, because it's divided. I mean, those are their checks and balances. So unless you have people in power who get along very well, they tend to fight each other, um, which is something you see in Ukraine. The people who went out onto the streets in the Maidan and demanded the overthrow of the Yanukovych government, the one that had been previously in power and the guy who uh, fled and went to Russia, um, those people are very frustrated now. They have not seen the reforms that they went out into the streets for. 
Uh, they see their government is still being controlled by very rich people, um, it, and it does look like they, you know, seem likely to continue to, to steal uh, everything they can get, just as they had for the last 20 odd years. So there's a lot of frustration. Um, the Prime Minister, uh, just uh, the other day, there was a vote um, in the Parliament, first on whether the Parliament as a whole felt that the government was doing satisfactory work. And it was over, overwhelming that it was not. They then called for a confidence vote in the Prime Minister, and he survived it. So they did not get rid of him. Now, they had no one to take his place. There were all sorts of speculation, but clearly no real plan. Um, and so in some ways, it's good that he survived the vote because there would have been a lot of chaos if he hadn't. In other ways, it's very frustrating to the people who protested and risked their lives to try to get a better, a better system and f are finding that they have not gotten that. So that's the situation in Ukraine now. Um, I'd like to go into the area uh, that perhaps doesn't have direct influence on the U.S. at this point, but it's the old stands, the Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, where there seems to be, which were former Russian areas of influence, but we also know that China is trying to gain these over, and it seems as if perhaps there's a power play there. What's Russia's attitude about it, and is there a way that we may get drawn in, or what do you see happening in the future in this area? That's a great question. Um, so the Central Asian countries, indeed, they were part of Russian Empire. They were part of the Soviet Union. Um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they've all pursued fairly different foreign policies and the extent to which s they have courted the West. Some of them, others have uh, done that less so. They've sought to get more Western assistance. For a while, they were kind of flavor of the week in Washington. But um, after the United States went into Afghanistan, there was a lot of interest in getting some sort of basing and facilities which they got to varying degrees. Then the U.S. got kicked out of Uzbekistan for too much criticizing of their human rights um, behavior, which is generally not very good. Uh, but, you know, it's not very good in much of that region. Um, right now, because the U.S. has a much smaller footprint in Afghanistan and is pl not planning to enlarge it, the U.S. is largely staying out. China has a lot of has a lot of economic interest in Central Asia, and th those have, as you say, those have been growing. Russia and China, to some extent, cooperate. They're both um, founding members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which includes them and these countries in Central Asia. And the idea is to coordinate policy and coordinate positions. Russia is nervous that it's going to lose its influence. Um, but not, but it doesn't really have much of an alternative to working with China. Uh, the Chinese are actually putting money into these countries, which while there's still a lot of Russian investment there, Russians right now are not putting much money into anywhere. Uh, so I think this is something to watch. I don't think the United States is likely to get dragged in, but I do think this is one area where the Sino-Russian relationship is it's kind of emblematic of both the cooperation and the distrust and the lack of conviction that interests are common and kind of this Russian fear that the Chinese are going to kick them when they're down, and the Chinese interest in just making money out of all of this and exploiting the resources that exist that kind of come at each other, and you could see ways that it unfolds that um, could uh, be detrimental to the Sino-Russian relationship. Okay. Um, so in the 1960s, we were ready to go to war with, with uh, the Soviet Union at the time, a nuclear war, because of the missiles in Cuba. We considered that a threat to our existence. Flash forward 50 odd years, we have nuclear forces on the border of, the, of Russia. So I, I kind of think that they feel justified by for feeling threatened by what we're doing, and I and I would like to cite Henry Kissinger as someone who kind of supports my point of view. He, you know, when the uh, Maidan uprising happened, he said that the Russians justifiably feel threatened. That we've been pushing uh, against Russia's security concerns since the Clinton years. Um, and that um, we're not really respecting their sensitivities. 
it seems to me we've reignited a Cold War with a country that really can annihilate us. And I think I'd like us to feel more cautious than we have. What do you think? Yes, what do you think? Are we taking, our, well, that's a speech, okay. So the question is, are we taking care that we're not going to wind up in a nuclear war with Russia, either in Syria because of the, the Syria or in, in uh, something happening in Europe. So I'm going to say it takes a lot to get to a nuclear war. Um, I would also say that Russia is less concerned about the dual capable aircraft in Europe than it is about missile defenses in Europe because it's worried that missile defenses in Europe, which I mean this, this is just this fascinating thing because we have missile defenses that don't actually work that well, but the, Rus the Russians are convinced that they will eventually work well enough to shoot down their missiles in the event that we're about to launch a huge debilitating first strike against them, they will not be able to shoot that first strike, that we, when they retaliate against that, somehow the missiles in Europe are going to stop their missiles, right? It, it's all game th theory, and it's a little ridiculous. We are convinced that these things, um, we, we keep saying these things will never threaten the Russian deterrent. The Russians keep saying that the Iranian, North Korean, whoever threat is not big enough to justify these missiles. So, you know, um, it, it's a question of what you believe is, they, they believe in the development of our missile defenses. We seem to believe in the development of third party missiles. Neither of these things actually still exist, exist at this point. Um, look, I think everyone in both Russia and the United States is very well aware of the fact that the other country has huge strategic arsenals that could blow up the world. Um, could people make a mistake? Absolutely. I'll tell you what worries me most in the context of a possible nuclear war. What worries me most in the context of a possible nuclear war is that the Russians put an awful lot of their strategic missiles on silo, strategic weapons on silo-based missiles. Silo-based missiles are ones that would not survive a first strike, which means that they have to be launched very early on warning, if not as a first strike. At the same time, Russian, the Russian early warning system is not very good. It has deteriorated tremendously, and Russia hasn't invested in that, which means that the possibility of a Russian launch on false warning, while I don't think this is going to happen, but boy, it's more likely than I'd like it to be. I mean, I really think that the likelihood of any sort of nuclear force use by the United States or Russia would be accidental rather than intentional. And that is the way that I would see a plausible unfolding of it. And I still don't think that's high risk because I think people are sane. But that's what I worry about. Not that, I mean, what are we going to do? We're going to piss them off so much over Ukraine that they're going to launch a nuke at us? I don't think so. Some, how do you see Syria escalating into a nuclear war between the United States and Russia? I, I mean, where you need to, to get to a scenario with possible nuclear use, you need, in principle, to be threatening the ex Russia. You need to be posing an existential threat to Russia. Right now, what you've got is a lot of jockeying by the Russians and by the United States to try to figure out what, you know, who controls what, which, which countries have agency to make their own decisions and which ones don't. Uh, all of these things. If you believe in a 19th century view of great power conflict, which I think Vladimir Putin does, uh, and I think Henry Kissinger does, where there are great powers that make the decisions and little powers that are the candy that one of them drops or picks up, then you're describing something that makes a lot of sense and they should sit down and redraw the maps and just figure out who controls what. If you think that every country has a voice and agency, you're going to have a little bit of a problem with that. So, you know, that, I think that's where it comes down to. But I don't, I don't think at present it's that U.S. behavior is risking nuclear war. Hi. Um, it seems to me that Russia could be a hero if it just found a way to get rid of Assad per se and keep the Alawite government in place, give Assad a Dacha, and then declare victory, the, the, the government replacing him will say we will not step on the Sunnis, the, the, the uh, Daesh will become less pop, powerful because they won't be afraid of the Alawites. Why doesn't Russia try to do something like that? They could keep 
Syria in their palm, just get rid of Assad as the man? Well, rumors are that it has, right? I mean, there were these reports that they've been talking to Assad and trying to convince him to step down, and it hasn't happened. Uh, he refused. I mean, this, this is the problem. Other countries do have agency. Other leaders do make decisions. Uh, you can't make them do things. Um, the Russians always think that we should be able to make European countries do whatever it is our bidding is. We seem to think that they can put sufficient pressure on Assad to step down. It may just be that neither of us have that level of influence. My question is about energy. Um, do you know if there's any strate uh, strategy in Russia to develop sustainable energies like solar power? I know their engineers are pretty clever. And so is there any uh, encouragement from Putin toward that or he doesn't really care? <laughs> So Russia has done very well with old school, not terribly clean uh, fossil fuel extraction, um, so much so that it has failed to invest in new and cleaner approaches. Um, there, you know, look, there are scientists in Russia who work on these questions. There are certainly some businesses that are interested, but this hasn't gotten the level of support that, for instance, it gets in the United States. There are environmentalist groups in Russia, but there's always concern that they might be in some way oppositional. They certainly sometimes oppose local governments and local business interests, so they tend to get shut down. So I would say there are some great minds in Russia that could work on these issues, but in terms of a sustained effort there, I don't really see it. Yes, uh, I really enjoyed your uh, speech today. Thank you very much. And I came with a special interest. Uh, do you think uh, Russia is uh, uh, trustworthy enough uh, that one day if that little country Armenia is attacked by all these Russian uh, Muslim countries around it, do you think Russia will protect us? The Armenians? Mm -hmm. Russia is selling weapons to Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, Russia gets a lot out of the continued standoff. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is permanently on the verge of flaring up. Uh, but Russia does have an alliance commitment with Armenia, which means, <coughs> you know, it'll probably keep selling you weapons, uh, selling the Armenians weapons. It, uh, okay, you know, I, but I don't think, I, I also don't think all of the Muslim countries around Armenia are on the verge of attacking Armenia. Um, I think that the nagorno karabakh conflict is Armenia and Azerbaijan. And, you know, honestly, if there was a way to calm that and settle that, um, that would be a great boon for peace. Uh, it would also enable Armenia to normalize relations and trade and uh, have much more economic growth than it's had up, up to now. So, but I would say that it's the standoff between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which Russia in many ways helps maintain, uh, that's really at, at the center here. How would you characterize the state of the current Russian economy? Uh, dismal. <laughs> Uh, I would argue that there are three things that make it dismal. Um, one of them is sanctions. But if sanctions were lifted tomorrow, the Russian economy would not recover because of the other two. One of those is the price of oil. The third is the failure over the last 20 odd years to implement structural reforms to, that would keep Russian money at home and drive for, bring foreign money into Russia to stay. Uh, that would encourage investment and make people feel like this is a good country to invest in. And because of that, even if the oil price went up a bit and sanctions were lifted, uh, you'd still have a lot of investor fear, both um, on the part of foreign investors and honestly Russian investors who are afraid of what whether their money is going to survive Russia, uh, and you would still continue to have a lot of problems with that economy. Um, I would also say that the Russians are good at sucking it up. So, and particularly if they're being told and they believe that their economic problems are predominantly the fault of somebody else, namely Barack Obama or whoever succeeds him, they're going to say, "Okay, that's fine. Our, you know, our parents and grandparents have lived through worse." And indeed, they did. The '90s were worse. Uh, and, you know, if you want to go back to World War II, that was worse still. But the 90s alone were a lot worse than what is going on now. So there's a lot of room for things to get um, more painful before the Russians find it intolerable. Uh, I've heard of you that um, 
Russia is very happy to see the millions of refugees uh, knocking at Europe's door because it, um, it uh, affects the EU, it destables the EU, and makes it much more vulnerable. And Russia is very much in agreement with that, and that's why they don't care bomb bombing Syria. More refugees is actually better for them. So is that true? I, I think Russia doesn't particularly mind. It also, it distracts uh, as long as Europe is more focused on what it sees as a threat from the south and the potential of destabilization of their own societies. They are less worried about any potential Russian misbehavior or threats. I mean, that is that is a debate within NATO on what, what should, should you be worried about the south or should you be worried about the east? Which, which one is more of a concern? Um, I, I do think Russia does doesn't particularly mind. At the same time, uh, the overall displacement from Syria, and not just in Europe, but in the Middle East, right? It's Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and Turkey that are hosting millions of refugees. The, the people coming into Europe are a micro, it's a microscopic number compared to, to what's in Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey. Um, so that and its effects over time on the Middle East, on stability and security of these countries, uh, I think should be worrying Russia more than it is. But um, Russia does ha tend to have very tactical views of these things, that we're going to do what we can do now to attain our goals and worry about the repercussions later. I was surprised to uh, learn that some of the presidential candidates uh, think that among the countries on the western border of the Soviet Union, uh, Finland uh, and possibly even some of the Scandinavian countries are in danger of uh, Soviet aggression. Uh, what is your take on that and is there any truth to that? Uh, so the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, so nobody is at risk of Soviet aggression. Um, Russia has threatened the Finns and the Swedes. I mean, this is just this fantastic example of Russia trying to influence with misreading, because it very early on said that, you know, if the Finns and the Swedes get closer to NATO, there, you know, the possibility of a Russian military response is there, you know, that if you join this alliance that's hostile to us, well, then, you know, we could act. Which, of course, makes the Finns and the Swedes want to hold a military exercise with NATO as quickly as possible. Possible. Um, the Finns and the Swedes aren't as nervous as the Balts and the Poles, but they're keeping an eye on the situation and they're a bit nervous. Um, this, none of this means that the Russians are planning to invade anybody. They're pretty busy in Ukraine and Syria. They've got a lot going on. But you know what I think a lot of people in, administra in the administration would say is that it's low probability but high risk. And you have to reassure your allies and your friends and your partners. And let's face it, the door to NATO membership for Sweden and Finland is always open. Right? If they said they wanted to join, nobody would say, wow, we're not sure. Let's do a membership action plan and think about it. They'd say, well, yeah, you, you could contribute. You'd be good allies. Love to have you. Come on in. Um, so I think the fact that Russia is threatening these countries verbally, if not having any real intent, is, it's a matter of concern. This may be a somewhat naive question, but this recent detente or rapprochement between the Pope and the uh, Russian Orthodox, will that have any long-term influence, you think? Um, Maybe too early to know. I, yeah, so I would say that the Russian patriarch works very closely with Vladimir Putin. The patriarchy and the government um, have collaborated a lot on uh, including on this vision of a hostile west uh, that you know gets uh, portrayed to the Russian public um, and I'm not sure what the you know the Pope certainly has a lot of respect among Catholics the world over but I I have a hard time thinking through a scenario where this has you know where their, their relationship has a significant imp impact on foreign policy. Our media and, and even the advertisement for today's lecture substitutes Putin.
for Russia. And, and listening to you over this period of time, I get the impression that, that Russia will not behave very differently when Putin is succeeded by somebody. Is that what you mean to convey? I would say that Russia's interests are the same regardless of who's in charge. Um, I think there are there is a tendency towards overkill, a tendency towards um, unpredictability that is um, specific to Putin's leadership style. But if we think that Russia's interests would be fundamentally different under a different leader, I would say that we're thinking about it the wrong way. That was my question. Uh, uh, is it uh, reasonable to expect that um, a couple of factors might uh, restrain the aggressiveness of their foreign policy? For example, uh, the low price of oil, I understand half of the government revenues come from oil. Might that restrain them internationally? And also, what about uh, population trends? At least at one time, we were told that the population of Russia was on the decline. The birth rate was so low uh, that the population was not maintained. Your comment. So I'll, I'll start with the population question, and then I'll go to the price of oil in the economy and restraint. Um, so Russian demographics have actually shifted. Um, birth rates have gone up a bit. Uh, health, kind of health um, indicators have gone up a bit. But I would also point out that having a small population or a large population, I would argue in this day and age, is not necessarily a great indicator of power. Um, you know, you can do a lot with a small population if you have a knowledge economy. As long, you know, if you don't need a ton of people to make widgets, maybe you don't need a ton of people. Um, Russia's population um, also, you know, it, a lot of its growth is um, of its natural growth is from uh, Muslims. It's from not, it's from uh, non-Christian Russians, which concerns some people. It shows that you know, there are changes. And like the United States, a lot of uh, Russian population growth comes from immigration, uh, which also generally are people who um, are not ethnic Russians. Uh, a lot of them come from Central Asia. So you do have this interesting question of how Russia is changing over time. But that, that is a very long-term question. Um, in terms of the economy and the price of oil, so what we're seeing is that Russia isn't able to do everything it thought it could do. So it had these grandiose plans for the military and raise the budgets. It's had to scale some of that back. Even in scaling it back, though, military budgets are higher than they were in the past. So they're growing, but just they're growing at a lower rate. They're having to not implement some programs. Things are going to slow down a bit. Um, is this actually going to change what are their ambitions? Well, what do we think their ambitions are? We're not actually certain. But they are not going to be able to do everything that you know they had on the books to do, uh, certainly. Um, but what Russia has right now, in terms of its military, is a reasonably co competent regional force with more power projection capability than we thought it had, as evidenced by Syria. It's, not, it's going to maintain, be able to maintain that, even if it doesn't grow it particularly. Uh, as the seas above Russia start to melt further, uh, do you see possible new areas of uh, conflict developing? And if so, could you explain? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the Russians are really excited about the melting of the polar ice caps. Um, <laughs> Right, it's it's this. Uh, I was talking to a colleague about this, and she said, "So for the Russians, it's melt, baby, melt, right? Um, because it's going to allow for more transport routes, including for Russian energy, and it's going to make that cheaper. And there's, you know, Russian energy and transport companies have been kind of interested in that. Um, Russia has also been a bit bellicose here and there with the Arctic, you know, putting planting flags, uh, creating a new Arctic command. But when you look at their behavior, in the Arctic, it's been fairly cooperative and collaborative. They've looked for ways to explore jointly with other countries. They've gone through international uh, systems to adjudicate. Uh, they have joined with others in pressing on the United States to finally ratify the law of the sea. So their actual behavior in terms of um, land and, uh, and water has not been 
as provocative as some of the rhetoric. Um, so that's a positive. Uh, over time, well, we're going to have to see what happens. I mean, I think the United States plays a role here too in that if kind of we respond by militarizing it, they're going to be more likely to respond by militarizing it. If they respond by militarizing it, we're going to be more likely to respond by militarizing it. That creates more danger of conflict. If we keep looking at it as largely commercial, and they do too, then there's a lot of interest for everyone in cooperating. Um, so it's, it's another one to watch. But I tend not to try to panic too much about the Arctic quite yet. Uh, two related questions. Does Russia still feel pressure to develop warm water ports? And do they have any designs in Africa, in South America, as China does? So the Russians have not been seeking ports abroad in a long time. I mean, people made a big deal over their facility in Syria before the Russians started bombing, but that really, you know, that, that was more of a refueling station than a real port. Um, before the before the annexation of Crimea, the Russians had been building up um, the port at the Vorysysk, um, kind of on the on the Russian side of the of the Black Sea, uh, with the intention of moving the Black Sea fleet there eventually. Um, I don't see any evidence of Russian expansionism into Africa, uh, at least in the near term. Okay, everybody, I'm going to ask one last question, and then um, we'll thank Olga for this wonderful explanation of everything. And my, my last question is, um, is there an argument to be made, and if so, what is it, uh, that within the context of Russian leaders, Putin is doing a very good job? considering that he's taking some cash out of the country and things like taking that into account. But is there an argument to be made that way or is there no argument to be made? I don't know. He's thrust the country into economic uh, near collapse and um, <laughs> has probably poisoned its relations with Europe, has destroyed its relationship with Ukraine. Um, on the other hand, he's really, really popular. <laughs> So, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on how you evaluate your presidents. Are they good for your country, its economic growth, its peace and prosperity? Or do people really like them? Uh, because they've ostensibly gotten you up off your knees by standing up to the nasty bullying West, uh, even if that actually gets you nothing and uh, potentially hurts your chances for the future. So, um, I guess it depends on which of these things you find more important. <laughs> I'll take that as a no. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.